Hi everybody, Stu, AG6AG. This is a talk that I did for the Canal Valley Amateur Radio Club. Uh, it has to do with running HF and what you're in for once you upgrade from technician. Anyway, I hope you enjoy it. Wow, there's a lot of you out there. <laughs> I want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, my name is Stu, AG6AG, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about... Uh, what you do, you know, when you actually get to start using HF. So real quick though, uh, show of hands. Everybody that's upgraded from technician in the last year, can I, can I see a hand up there? Ah, very cool. All right, leave them up, leave them up. Now, if it's been longer than six months, then put your hands down. All right, if it's been longer than three months, put your hands down. Wow, okay. Anybody upgrade in the last month? Leave your hand up. Oh, you got, all right, then you guys that upgraded in the last month, stand up so everybody can give these guys a round of applause. Yeah, come on, come on. Wow. So uh, let me be the first one to congratulate everybody. All right, you have joined an elite group of people. You are now part of one quarter of all licensed amateurs in the United States that have risen to the ranks of general. Uh, and you know what? The adventure is now continuing, right? This is all new stuff. I mean, this is some cool, fun stuff you're going to get to play with. HF, my god, you can talk any place in the world on HF. You can do CW and don't even have to worry about figuring out how to do it in FM. <laughs> uh, you get to play with digital modes on sideband. You get to learn how to spend lots and lots of money. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> me that. <laughs> so I want to start off talking a little bit about antennas, okay? Uh, that seems to be a rousing question with every new uh, general or uh, extra that I talk to. And uh, I've solved all your antenna problems. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to introduce you to the Unicorn Antenna. This is the only antenna you will ever need. Sets up in minutes. Works regardless of mount height or polarity. Only one foot high and resonant on all bands. Ladies and gentlemen, this has a 20 dB gain in every direction. And it even works better buried underground. And as a bonus, it's military grade. So there is no such thing as a unicorn. And unfortunately, uh, got to tell you, 300 million meters per second, it's not just a good idea, it's the law. Uh, <laughs> so really, uh, most antennas uh, that you're going to see that you may purchase as really broadband antennas uh, usually are negative gain, negative dB antennas. Uh, they're usually compromises. Now, I'm not going to shoot them all down because that may be all you're able to do in your yard because of your property. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about some of your choices. So what antenna is best for you? Well, my, I personally love wire dipoles. I think they're the best thing since sliced bread, best thing since Oreo cookies. Um, they're really easy to build and deploy, and they're inexpensive. My god, they're made of wire. They're giving away 150 feet of it in the, you know, the, uh, the drawing tonight. Um, basically, you cut your wires equal length on both ends, you put a ballon in the middle, and you get it up in the air. Um, and it's fairly easy and inexpensive to deploy. It can be multi-band. You can take that uh, dipole and you can add additional bands. So you can have a fan dipole or a spread dipole. Um, and I'm going to use the term low visibility because compared to other antennas, a dipole is actually kind of low visibility. You just have some wire in the air. Uh, and uh, it takes a while for your neighbors to see it. They will eventually see it, but it takes a little while. <laughs> the cons? Well, it requires a bit of real estate. I mean, let's face it, let's say you want to do 40 meters, you need about 65 feet end to end for this antenna. Okay? 20 meters, cut that in half at about 33. Uh, but Hey, you got to get it up in the air. And because of the size and some of the other things, it may not work on all properties. Um, and it's directional. And it really is hard to turn, okay? 
I mean, it's not like I, I, you hang the wires and that's pretty much it. Great example is, let's say you got one end of the north and the other end of the south. Where's your null, right? Everything is just great this way, but if that way is Alaska and that way is South America, you're going to have a little bit of trouble talking to them. Uh, I'm not saying you can. I've done it on a dipole, north to south, but it can be a bit challenging. What are some of our other choices? Vertical antennas. Now, vertical, vertical antennas, the pros here, it's a manufacturing antenna. So you actually buy a vertical antenna, big hunk of aluminum, basically. Uh, it works in small yards, right? You don't need a lot of sideward real estate. You just need to be able to go up. And most of them are multi-band out of the box. They're designed to work on multiple bands, not just single bands. Um, medium visibility. It is a big piece of aluminum that's going to be sticking up, right? So um, just depends on your neighbors how good their eyesight is. Around my house, I just tell my wife, look, all the antennas here are temporary. <laughs> now, you know, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take these down any time. I also, you know, tell her, well, if you don't want to get mad, just don't look up. But, uh, that doesn't work, but... Um, so, it, uh, it can be stowed easily and it can be deployed easily. So you could use this as a portable antenna, typically, if you're going to take your stuff to a park or something like that. Fairly easy to get up in the air. Uh, the only problem is they do tend to bend and do other things, so you've got to be kind of protective of them. Uh, wire antennas, you just roll them in a big ball and hopefully you can untangle them. Um, now, the cons, they can be expensive. Anywhere from a couple hundred bucks to a couple thousand bucks, depending on what you're buying. Uh, initial assembly can be challenging. I think, I think there's a hustler out there that they, they make you adjust all the radials, right, and tune it, and it, it, it looked, I read the instructions before, I, I was thinking about buying one, and my God, it looked like it'd take me three weeks to get this thing set up. Um, they're usually zero dB gain or less, okay? Um, what that really means is that they're compromised in most cases, the multibands are. I mean, let's face it, if you're gonna try to do a quarter wave 40 meter antenna, you're going to have an antenna that's 35 feet long, right? And then you're going to have to mount that up off the ground and then figure out how to come up with a ground plane. Uh, especially if you live in a, a bowl, which I live in this dirt bowl, right? It's, it isn't very efficient. Um, and it tends to be a compromise in performance. Verticals tend to be a lot noisier. It's a lot harder to pick things out. So they're OK. They're not great. You want great? Let's talk about Yaggies. Ooh. Now there's a manufacturer antenna you can sink your teeth into. High gain in, uh, in the direction is pointed, and believe me, you've got to point them. Okay? Um, and they can be multi-band, uh, and uh, usually two or three bands. You can buy a single band. Um, they're visible from space, so <laughs> they'll be really popular. Um, now the cons, they're expensive. I mean, they're typically an expensive antenna to buy. Uh, initially setting it up, that requires some construction. I mean, you know how to wait up there. So you may be digging and pouring a slab and putting up a tower. And, uh, then you've got to figure out how to turn them, right? So then you're going to have a rotor on there. All that weight, all that wind load. Uh, sounds like a lot of fun, doesn't it? <laughs> the only real bad part is you now live in that house. Right. You know what that means? You live in that house when your neighbors are giving driving instructions to people. They go, just go down. It's two houses past the antenna farm over there. Make a run. You know? Or, what's all that over there? Oh, it's my neighbor. Oh. But they work great. Now, are there other antennas out there? Absolutely. You've got the long wire, OK, which is uh, you know, it is a little bit of a compromised antenna, but it covers a lot of bands, and for the most part, it works pretty well. you got to have a little bit of real estate to set it up, again, because it's a long wire. Uh, by the way, the wire antennas, the cool thing about those is if you don't have enough distance, you can kind of bend them and hook them and do all sorts of crazy stuff with them. You know, rather than just going straight out, you can go out and do one of these with the ends. As long as they're one wire, okay, and it stretches on out, as long as they're not looped and laying on top of each other, they work. Um, off-center fed dipole. I've never done an off-center fed dipole. 
Uh, they're, they're cool. I hear that they do all sorts of bands and everything else. I don't know. Everybody I've ever talked to that set it up says, yeah, well, I finally I'm close to getting in tune. I'm going to have to do it again next week. I don't know. Um, hey, I've seen guys load rain gutters. You got some metal rain gutters, hook yourself a wire up there with a ballon. Doesn't work great, but you're on the air. Flagpoles, that's a new popular thing, right? You get a big 25 foot flagpole, and then you run a wire to it with some, uh, a ballon, sink down the ground, and bada bing, bada boom. Put a good tuner on it, and guess what? You got an antenna. And when the neighbors say, What's that? Raise the American flag <laughs> for our troops. Um, metal fences also make antennas. I throw that in because I actually watched a gentleman by the name of Terry Graves load a chain, uh, not chain link, load a, uh, uh, oh, what was it, Vern? Um, it was uh, a uh, barbed, wire fence. barbed wire fence at the Radio Library and did 160 meters on it. <laughs> <laughs> and made a QSO. Wow. 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 So, again, the most important thing to remember is if you're on the air and you don't blow your radio up, you've got a good antenna. Okay? The only bad antenna is the one that you haven't put up. Get that antenna up in the air. And when you get it up in the air, then we got to start thinking about radios. <laughs> so, Everybody says, well, what radio would you recommend? And I always tell everybody, choosing a radio is more of a touchy-feely sort of thing. It's kind of like religion, right? If I asked three or four people, three or four hams in this room, what radio I should buy, I'm going to get six or seven answers, OK? All of them will be right. And every one of them is going to believe, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that his radio is the best, regardless. Why is that? <clears throat> a lot of it has to do with they're good radios, right? They're able to use them. They work in every fashion that they want to be able to use them in. But they understand them. They use them. They know how to use them. They've gone through that learning curve. And guess what? You're going to have a learning curve. So you've got a couple choices. You can go with an all-band, all-modes radio. This is kind of like a shack in the box, right? Because it does UHF, VHF, HF, all the bands, FM, AM, sideband, does digital, does CW, does everything. It slices, it dices. <laughs> Amazing radio. However, it's a jack of all trades, and it really is a master of none. Typically, the uh, channel storage on it is very limited. So if you're figuring you're going to use it for all the FM uh, repeaters, and you have, oh, I don't know, 60 or 70 repeaters that you typically program in, or <coughs> frequencies you typically program in, you might be hard pressed to get 60 or 70 of uh, VHF and 60 and 70 of UHF. It just isn't as much room as these FM uh, radios that you purchase for your car or for your house. So they still work. And they're good radios on uh, FM. VHF, UHF. Now, HF, what's more important, a good transmitter or a good receiver? Receiver. Ah, I, I hear a lot of old hams out there. <laughs> Giving away uh, your uh, length of license there, guys. Yes, absolutely, your receiver. The receiver is how you get to hear who you're going to talk to. And modern receivers now have the most amazing filters and everything else. They're great because you can turn around and filter out all the noise. You can shift your intermediate frequency over to try to block out this guy here or there. You can put a notch in and just knock this one bit of interference right out. Now, all those require different little knobs and buttons. And the problem with an all band is there's only a couple knobs and buttons. So you end up going down into menus three or four buttons deep to get to that. The downside of that? You're not hearing enough of the person. By the time you get down to that and try to start adjusting it, the person's already stopped talking. Okay? You really want those readily available to you. So my recommendation, if you're going to be serious about HF, is buy an HF-only radio. Uh. <laughs> I, I will tell you that I, I happen to own the uh, FTDX3000. I love that radio. 
Um, all the filters and everything are really easy for me to get to. I figured out how to interface it with my computer. See, religion, mm -hmm. right? It's a religious experience. I talk to anybody in this room that's adding exposure to the uh, ICOM IC7610, they're going to say, most amazing radio in the world has better reception than anything. And you know what? It has great reception. It's an absolutely awesome radio. Um, you know, and here, over here, we've got this little Kenwood. Um, I forget, is this a 480 or is it a 5-something? What is that Kenwood? We've got one in there. 480? I actually really like this little Kenwood. It's got a few filters, um, not as many as I, I have on my 3000, but more uh, than most of these uh, budget HF rigs have. But the filters that it does have are easy to get to and they work very well. If you want to see this radio in action, go talk to uh, Zach over there. He's got one right in that room that he uses every Tuesday night. Or Yeah, yeah, you're, yeah, your baby over there, right? All right. <laughs> great radio. But there are tons of radios out there. So you yeah, bought your radio. You got your radio. You got your antenna. You're getting ready to hook it together. Um, well, we're back to that antenna. So yeah, you've got a compromised antenna or you've got, uh, you got a uh, dipole that isn't quite high enough, that it's not quite able to get that SWR down completely. You got a 40 meter antenna that's a little too low to the ground and a little too, uh, uh, too high Q. High Q just means it really narrow frequency availability for the antenna. Um, hey, you tune it for the frequency you're going to use all the time, get it as close as you can, but everything on either side, is it just it's like this giant U if you take a look at the SWR graph on it. So <clears throat> what do we do? Well, first off, I say you need a tuner. You can tune it so you're not going to damage your radio. That's the most. That's what tuner is for. It doesn't make you transmit any better. It keeps you from blowing the finals out of your radio. But do I really need a tuner? The answer is no to any of the following questions, and you probably want a tuner. Your antenna SWR is always under 1.4 to 1. Yeah, that's never going to happen. You're running an amplifier. You or you're not running an amplifier. If you're running an amplifier, um, the SWR problem goes up kind of in magnitude. <laughs> well, am I talking too loud? Um, if, you're, if you're running an amplifier, you definitely want a tuner because your SWR issues go up um, as you go higher in wattage. Um, if you're not going to be on 60 meters or longer and you're under 1.4 to 1, you probably don't have to have a tuner, okay? Um, that's just because as you get into the longer bands, right, you begin to have more and higher Q, right? So you end up with a narrower, narrower area of frequency that you're able to get that good match on. Um, oh, and of course, if you have unlimited funds and don't care if you burn your radio up, then you know what? Don't buy a tuner. And then of course, you know, if you bought a radio for show and will never use it. Don't even bother buying an antenna. <laughs> so, all kidding aside, um, I am a strong proponent of using tuners. And I, let's save the questions for the end, okay? Um, and the reason that I am is I have blown finals up, okay? Um, and, you know, I'm just trying to cover my you-know-what and cover yours as well. So um, let's talk about hints for tuners, okay? When you do tune your radio, you never want to tune on top of someone. In other words, you're spinning the dial, you find somebody who's calling CQ, don't turn around and key up on them to tune your radio. Oh, that's so annoying. Move 3K off where you're not going to interfere with them, okay? Um, Make notes of frequency tuner settings. So if you're running a manual tuner, okay, go about 10K, 20K or whatever and tune it, right, where nobody's on there and make a note. You also want to do that with your auto tuner because your auto tuners have memory, right? So we call it training the tuner. 
just move along and tune on those frequencies. That way, it's not going to be sitting there grinding while it's trying to tune. It's going to make a couple clicks and you're done. Okay? Um, so, also remember this. Most tuner uh, power ratings are based on three, uh, 3 to 1 SWR as a max. So if you buy a you know, 100-watt radio and you buy a 100-watt tuner and your antenna is farther out than 3 to 1, which on the ends of my 40, it sure is, okay? Uh, I will tell you that um, I have to run a, a much higher uh, power tuner than 100 watts. Um, Understand, what does a tuner do? Does a tuner change the, uh, uh, the, uh, the antenna at all? Does it change the antenna? No, it doesn't change the antenna. What does it do? It basically adjusts with uh, capacitors and inductors. It basically changes what the radio sees the antenna has, right? Once it gets past that tuner, it's still got to go to that antenna. And that reflective power is still coming back, okay? That reflective power, what's it do? It comes back and it bangs up against that tuner and then bounces back out and jumps back and forth and dissipates. But a lot of the power is dissipated in heat inside the tuner, right? So just like anything else, right, over by, okay? Uh, 100 watt tuner, eh, 250 watts is probably a good choice, right? Uh, that's up to you, though. And, and if you're able to get an antenna up in the air and get it tuned to where you don't need a tuner, more power to you. Uh, the only other thing that I'll toss out is the tuners that are built into radios, uh, you know, the tuner, they say, oh yeah, it comes with the tuner. They're not good for much more than three to one, okay, period. And they're not going to tune it, you know, if it's four to one, four and a half to one. So I really recommend the external tuner. All right, off my pedestal. All right, so... You have new privileges. Oh, wow. That's great, huh? Well, guess what? You're a general. So look at this big hole in the middle here. We've got a hole in the middle there. We've got holes in the middle there, a hole in the middle there, big hole in the middle there. So you need to understand what frequencies you have privileges on, OK? If you're gone all the way to an extra, great. You just need to remember to make sure that we do use a uh, phone in the phone area and data or CW in the data CW area. Uh, you're not going to hear someone, hopefully, outside of those areas doing either one. Uh, but there's a lot of uh, extras and uh, oh, uh, advanced that are operating in that area that you can't operate in. So what do we do about that? Well, so when I'm preparing to use a band, I make a note of the upper and lower frequencies that I have allotted for that band. So I, I put them on a piece of paper. I've got them right on the table next to the radio. I can look at that frequency and I can glance down and know that I'm within my privileges. Old Ham once told me, you know, the best way to hunt tune, hunt tune is when you start at one end and you start sweeping, listening for somebody there. So the best way to hunt tune is on upper sideband, go from the low frequency to the high frequency. On lower sideband, go from the high frequency and roll down to the lower frequency. That is really because your ears do much better going from that helium high voice down to normal. You catch that faster than going from this garbly thing up to normal. You almost always run past it, depending on the direction you're going. Uh, now, once you get really good at it, Hey, right? Tune down. I end up going a little bit past. I know I do because I can hear the helium coming out. And I bring it back, and then I'm in tune. Okay? But uh, to start out with, when you're doing it, it just makes it easier to tune. Um, whenever you're preparing to call CW, pick a frequency and listen. Listen for a while. Make sure there's nobody on it. Make sure nobody's already using it. Right? Then, Ask if the frequency is in use, right? Easy enough. This is AG6AG. Is anyone using this frequency? Unkey the mic and wait. Do that a couple of times. If you don't hear anything, hey, guess what? It's your frequency. Go ahead. Start calling CQ. Find somebody out there. Same thing, I believe, with CW, right? Just 
listen, make sure you're not walking on anybody. We're all supposed to share the frequencies like, you know, brotherly love, all that. Um, so the only other thing I'm going to talk about really briefly, and this, a friend of mine had this idea that I should talk to you about operating split. Um, of the guys that have upgraded in the last year, with a show of hands, how many people know what operating split is? All right. Good deal. So, so you want to explain that? No. <laughs> That's what you're here for. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Operating split basically means that you are operating on, you're transmitting on one frequency and you're receiving on another frequency. Kind of like a repeater, right? Same sort of idea, but the idea is that it allows you to have a QSO with other countries that possibly might not have license space within the general space. So you're rolling down and you hear somebody in the extra side, but they say, hey, CQ, CQ, uh, listening 10 up, okay? That's gonna mean they're 10 kilohertz up. So you transmit 10 kilohertz up to them, which may be in your band, you're receiving down the other band. Because uh, guess what? What privileges do you need to monitor a frequency? No license, right? If you can hear it, it's yours. Okay? Um, DX expeditions also often use this method. Okay? Why do they use it? Well, that way, everybody's talking on this side, but when they're calling CQ on that side, there's nobody interrupting them. Okay? Works really well also allows other people to help stack things. Uh, and it can also be used to avoid noise, you know, on opposite sides of a QSO. If I'm having a conversation with somebody in Florida, uh, he may have a bunch of QRM. Yeah, how many people know what QRM is? Yeah. Interfering transmissions, okay? He may have a bunch of QRM on this frequency, but I have none on that frequency over here. But I have QRM on a frequency that he has no QRM on. He can transmit to me on the one he has QRM on, because it's not going to matter to me. I'm nice and quiet. I'll be able to hear him. Vice versa, I can talk back to him, right? Because all those ton of noise where I'm at, and I can go ahead and get to him. Okay? All right. So, um, again, when calling CQ while running split, you should announce that you are running split by saying, I'm listening 10K up or down or along that lines, let them know where you're actually listening. Um, anyway, so <clears throat> I, used a, I used a Q code, didn't I? I used QRM. And QSO. <laughs> yeah, that's true. You caught me. You caught me. Uh, Q codes, really, really important. I'm not going to go through these one at a time, but I'll tell you that uh, QRZ is one you're going to hear a lot in contests on pileups. Somebody is going to uh, finish a QSO with somebody. By the way, a QSO is nothing more than uh, a conversation between two people or a contact. Um, so you're going to hear them hopefully give their call sign after they're done and say QRZ as a question, right? And QRZ is, who's calling me? Okay? Who's calling me? That's, that's what it is. Um, QRP. If somebody says, hey, I'm running QRP, it means they're running low power. In um, Morse code, CW, right, QRP means reduce power. QRO means increase power, okay? These are very common ones. Uh, let's see, uh, QTH, what's your location, right? Where are you? Oh, my QTH is Thousand Oaks, California. All the do day. All right, um, QSL, phrase this question. We have you 5-9 QSL. In other words, did you receive? The response is QSL, please copy, have you 5-9 also, okay? So those Q codes, by the way, um, I'm sure everybody here that's been uh, an amateur radio operator for a while knows that these Q codes developed in maritime radio, okay? And that's where they came out of originally. Isn't that right, Norm? Maritime and old-time aviation. Okay. Um, and they were used because it's much easier when you're doing CW to give a series of letters rather than actually type something out like, did you hear me? Also, worldwide, uh, there are no 
stations that begin with the letter Q. Oh, all right. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Anyway, so, hey, download these from the internet. Just search Q codes. You can look them up, <coughs> figure out how to use them, have fun with them. So, let's see. We've got a radio. We've got a tuner. We've got an antenna, coax. Uh, I guess we need meters. <laughs> so, um, I, I, I do a lot of stuff with my computer when I'm operating. Uh, but there are certain things that are very important to watch as a new operator. And even as an old operator, it's a really good idea to get in the habit of uh, watching what I call the triangle. I want to watch my wattage output, my SWR, and my ALC. And I can do that very simply by looking at these two meters that I have on my radio. Uh, on the top, over here, I've got my forward and, uh, wattage, okay, so that's my output power. Over on the other side, I got my reflected, all right, that's how much coming coming back in. And where these two needles cross, each one of these lines tells me what my SWR is. And uh, who can tell me what ALC means? All right. So, we use ALC to keep from uh, uh, coming up uh, much like over deviating in FM. Uh, it's called, uh, what's it called? Uh, what is it? Overmodulation. Well, overmodulation, we also call it clipping, right? Who said clipping? I, I heard somebody say, thank you. Um, so we use it to keep from clipping. So what it does is it basically pulls the mic volume back when it gets up to the point where it's going to see the envelope for your sideband uh, transmission. And um, usually, to adjust where you want to be, about in the center is really good, OK? Um, if it bounces up every once in a while, it's going to pull back. So you don't really want it to bounce up much past that nice fat area down there. Every HF radio that I've ever sat at has a ALC meter, OK? And the way you would adjust it is your mic gain. You turn your mic gain up or you turn your mic gain down based on where that ALC is. Uh, some other things I like to watch is a high SWR warnings uh, on most HF radios. It pops up red light on mine. It says, high SWR, you know? And I say, hi, SWR. Uh, no. Uh, so it's an indication that, yeah, your antenna's out of tune, but I should see that anyway from watching my reflected power, okay? Um, also, I want to look for input voltage drops, okay? Um, you know, make sure the voltage meter that I uh, have on my power supply is reading properly, okay? Make sure that the radio isn't dimming. Why is my radio dimming? Anyway, um, and then, of course, computer interfaces. So this is HDSDR over here, and uh, that allows me to use a uh, SDR dongle as a um, pan adapter, which I'm basically looking at the entire frequency, and this waterfall is showing me uh, the different uh, transmissions that are going on throughout the frequency. The way I have it set up is I can take my mouse, and I can just click on it. Go back. I can take the mouse, and I can just, where are you, click on it, and that will automatically tune the radio and everything else. Uh, this over here is just a radio interface that allows me to remote control the radio from my computer. Um, and uh, half the time I'm with the mouse over here changing settings, the other half the time I'm touching the radio because it's easier that way. Uh, but this all depends on the radio that you have and your desire uh, to how fast you want to get at this, okay? I like contesting. I told my son, years ago that I contest, but I don't care if I win. Ball. I care if I win. <laughs> um, so I also like running digital. So this is something else you can get into. This is FL Digi. Um, if you're in emergency services here in the county, you know that we use FL Digi as a uh, transmission method every Tuesday night, OK? Uh, and if you can run FL Digi from home on FM, do it. Just ask Zach. He'll tell you exactly how to do it. Uh, now, how many people know what FT8 is? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, over here, I got people just jumping out of their seat. Yeah, 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 FT8, FT8. 
So FT8 has taken uh, digital by storm. It's taken over uh, w, uh, uh, oh, uh, JT65. Uh, it's taken over PSK31. Of course, people are starting to filter back into PS, PSK31, so don't count that one out. But this has allowed people to get work to all states in what, three months, Zach? You did it in three months? Uh, two months. Two months. Worked all states award two months on an FTA. How cool is that, right? This is a lot of fun if you like just clicking and waiting, <laughs> clicking and waiting. Actually, you know, I, I, I joke about that. I, I, I tell people that uh, when I'm going to be on the radio, I sit down and I listen on the phone and I try to find somebody that I can talk to on phone. And then uh, I'll move down to PSK 31, and I'll listen on there, and I might call CQ a few times on that. If I don't have anything there, ah, heck with it. I'll go down to FT8, because at least I can make some QSOs if nobody else is around. Um, but a lot of people, for a lot of amateur radio operators, this became the latest and greatest thing. And so you're going to make all these QSOs. Oh my god, you're going to talk to people all over the world. Think about that. How cool is that, right? I, I told my daughter that, and uh, my dad, or my daughter's a millennium, and she says, Dad, I can call a random number and talk to anyone all over the number. And I say, yeah, they probably will port you to the phone company. You know? um, part of the fun of talking to people all over the world is sending or receiving QSL cards. Now, this is, this is not something that everyone does, OK? And I don't just send QSL cards to every person I have a QSL with, OK? Uh, QSL card is basically kind of like a postcard. And then you fill out all the information about the QSO that you've had with that person. And then you stick a stamp on it, and you mail it to them via this thing called the US Postal Service. Uh, for those of you that only use email, it's, it's kind of archaic, but it works. Um, and they get one. They go over, they check their log to confirm that it actually was a real QSO. Okay? That's the important part, is when you get one of these things, you need to say, oh, they said I talked to them on this date. You have to look at your log and say, yeah, you know what? He did. So, boom, you send him back a QSL card. Okay? Now, why do you do it? I don't know. It's fun. Why do people uh, want to receive them? Well, great example. Stu back here, the president of uh, the club, has 49 states on Logbook of the World. 49, he's one state away. He has a QSL card from somebody in that state. He can use that as evidence to get the 50th state, OK? So that's why you do it. And plus, God, it's so retro and fun. And they're not real expensive, right? So yeah, give it a try. Why not? But remember. What do you have to verify against when you get a, QSO, a QSL card? Log. Log. Oh, God. So why do we keep a, keep a log? HF QSOs tend to be uploaded to QSL or EQSL services, OK? Many HF operators use their QSOs to apply for awards using services like Logbook of the World or QRZ.com or even EQSL. When participating in a contest, submitting a log helps those that you have had QSL uh, uh, confirm it in the contest. And it's also kind of fun to look back at some of the strange and exotic places you've had the opportunity to talk to. Um, I was looking through some of my very early contacts on a digital log before I was importing it into my master log. And I found that I had had a QSO with New Caledonia, or Caledonia, yeah. And, uh, I had uh, no idea when I made the QSO where the hell I knew Caledonia was. So my US geography was really, or my US geography. Yeah. <laughs> you see? <laughs> okay, okay. My, my world geography was really terrible. Uh, but it was neat to look and realize, hey, you know, that's all the way down by Australia, right? This is cool, right? And there's probably about 10 guys on that island total that do, do amateur radio, but it's kind of nice. Um, and as far as turning a log in for people in contests, well, let's be honest. Turning a log in to a contest, turning a log into ARRL for Logbook of the World, what does that do? That provides ammunition 
to ARL to prove that there are people actually using these bands, okay? I mean, let's face it, they've got to go in front of the FCC every few years and fight for our allocations, right? And they can say, well, look, look at all this, right? So it doesn't hurt to turn your login. Now, you probably won't be turning a login like this anymore. <laughs> this is a handwritten log. And I'll be honest with you, this is not what my first handwritten log looked like. It looked more like a chicken on whiskey <laughs> that stepped in the ink, decided to get on a piece of paper. Um, this is beautiful. Boy, you know, I, amazing. The problem with handwritten logs, though, is what? Hey, you eventually you got to get them into digital if you're going to turn them into anything anymore because everybody wants stuff in digital format. So we get into computer logging. Here are some of the more popular computer logs. Logbook for OM, uh, that stands for Log for Old Man or Old Men. Uh, don't ask me, I didn't name it. Um, that happens to be currently what I'm using for my logs. Um, and uh, I gotta tell you, I really like it. I'm able to auto-upload stuff, it's really cool. I uh, used to use Logger32, um, and that's a great logging program. Very difficult to configure, and I wasn't really happy with the speed of their uh, bug fixes, so I, I tried out Logger for OM, and I just went with it. Uh, N1MM, contesting only. Don't try to use this as a daily logger. It just it doesn't work as a daily logger. But if you're doing any contest, it's the most amazing contest log program I've ever seen. Um, HRD, Ham Radio Deluxe. This is a pay for play you see dollar signs there. I think it's something like a hundred and something dollars a year for the subscription or something like that. I don't know. I know that there's a old free version floating around on the internet that's unsupported. Um, but I'm told by people that run it, it's the best thing since uh, Oreo cookies. So uh, N3FJP, I know nothing about this logging program other than you guys use that over there. We've got a little cluster of folks that are into that. And they really like it, okay? And it's all about what you want to use, okay? It's what you're most comfortable with. And of course, I include FL Log because it's written by the same guys that did the FL Digi project. It is totally unsupported now, although it doesn't really do anything that's going to give you any headaches about bugs. Um, and uh, it works really well as a very simple logging program. It's enough to get it into a log. Uh, you tried that, didn't you, for a while, Norm? I've tried a few of those. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm back on paper. Well, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, all right. How about just doing it online then? Okay, because there's a few online software. Was that yours with a nice handwriting? No, no that wasn't mine. <laughs> <laughs> that one, by the way, was from 1977. Uh, anyway. Uh, let's see, qrz.com. They have an online log that you can use. You can enter all your QSOs and stuff like that. Uh, that being said, the, uh, uh, the log itself um, is a little archaic, but it works. And the big thing with that is you have to be a member. You have to have a subscription to QRZ, which means you're going to pay a little money. I'll tell you that if you're using any of the other logging software, they use QRZ for lookup, and you're going to need at least XML access to QRZ if you want to use that. So you're going to be paying a little money to QRZ. And, which I'm fine with, by the way. I use their, the, the you-know-what out of their service. And they do a really good job. Um, EQSL, you can enter QSLs right through the EQSL interface. Uh, how many people know what EQSL is? By the way, I mentioned it a couple times. Um, it is an electronic QSL service. No more paper. Um, you go, you log in, you look, and you have all these QSL cards from uh, you know, contacts that you made. And the hand log, uh, oh, excuse me, uh, logbook of the world. You can enter QSOs individually in logbook of the world. But, oh my god, it's so hard. So uh, Handlog EU, European logging software. I've never used it, but it's on the top list of uh, good logging softwares. So we're almost done. Yay! Uh, but I want to talk a little about tools before we close out. So we need, you need to have tools. You need them. I'm sorry. You need to have some tools. Uh, more than just you know your, your little pair of pliers and screwdriver. 
you really need good crimping tools, right? If you're going to be putting uh, uh, Anderson connectors on the end of a wire or whatever, buy a decent crimper, okay? If you don't, you're going to be out in the middle of nowhere and it's going to pull out a little metal thing. It's worth the investment. A soldering station, So, you ever try to do this, okay? I got a DIM connector that I needed to get over into a RCA connector. And I needed to figure out a way to get two pins on this 10 pin adapter to this RCA connector. Now, it doesn't matter why I had to do it, okay? All right? Really, it doesn't. I mean, because what I was doing, I had to do it, right? Without a soldering station and heat shrink, and a lot of profanity. I would have never gotten this done. <laughs> so, you saw that I use, uh, you know, an SWR power meter on my rig. Um, you've got to have one of those. My recommendation too is have an extra one that's loose. Uh, you never know when you might want to check the power on a radio for a friend or something like that. It's easier just to grab an SWR power meter out of a toolbox and take it with you when you're doing that. And of course, if you're testing power, you're going to need a dummy load. And you should have a dummy load, right? You certainly want a dummy load when you're cleaning up a radio to see if it actually transmits so you don't blow the finals out of it. Um, technicians, you should all have a digital volt ohm meter. Not all of you probably did when you were technicians, but you should own one. Uh, I happen to like having a amp meter as well, which basically allows me to see how much power my equipment is drawing. If I'm running off battery for an event or something like that, I can kind of try to guesstimate how much power this battery is going to give me before I'm in trouble and I can't work anymore. Um, this is one nobody ever thinks of, manuals for all your equipment, okay? Um, you know, I've got PDFs on my phone, I've got PDFs on my computer, uh, I've got certain pages printed that I go to all the time. I don't care how good your memory is, and mine's failing more and more every year, uh, but I need to look stuff up a lot, because I'm in menus and stuff a lot to change settings, right? That's what this is all about, experimentation. You're going to be playing with this stuff. Um, so a couple things on the end are kind of, gee, they'd be nice. An antenna analyzer. I honestly believe that every amateur radio operator should own an antenna analyzer. Uh, the reason being is, hey, you get to tune the antenna before you start keying your radio on it, okay? Uh, there's real advantages to that. It's also a heck of a lot easier to stand there spinning a knob or pushing a bunch of buttons, right, to, in order to be able to check that antenna and not sitting there keying and tuning and looking. Uh, it just makes it easier. And, you know, I put up a lot of antennas. I probably rotate out six, seven antennas a year, okay? So for me, it's worth it, right? Um, an oscilloscope, eh, maybe not to you're an extra. I don't know. Uh, I have an oscilloscope. I use it a couple times a year. It's really, really good if you're looking for just momentary voltage <laughs> drops and things like that because you can see the power run across. I'm talking DC, and you can see it drop. You can't necessarily see that on DVOM. It, it isn't fast enough to see it. You can also see issues with alternating current or alternating power uh, variances and things like that. So, <clears throat> hopefully, I've told you everything you ever needed to know about AJAP. But I'm sure there might be some questions. All right, you had your hand up first over there. <laughs> well, my original question was concerning the built-in tuners and transceivers, which you did talk about. So you, um, recommend an additional antenna tuner just basically running them in series and the one with the transceiver won't be ignored because the external unit will be matching the transmission. Yeah. Well, yeah, my, my opinion is if you're running an external tuner, you should not be running the internal tuner in the radio because you're going to have the battle of the tuners and neither one is going to have an actual grip on what's going on. So just the disable unit. the tuner in the air. Typically, yeah, just turn it off and just use the external. Uh, so, uh, my, and my real question now, though, I notice on band plans there's this thing called the calling frequency. Now, is that where you call CQ or just anywhere or what specifically? Well, so that's not on the band plan. 
That's on the, well, you're right, excuse me, that is on the band plan, okay? And um, a calling frequency, we typically have calling frequencies on VHF and UHF, right? National, uh, natural simplex frequencies like that. Calling frequencies, absolutely, you can use it as a calling frequency, but you can call CQ any place on the band. You have the privileges to use phone, and you can do CQ any place on the band with digital that you have privileges uh, for digital. Um, now, you might be easier to find somebody possibly making a call on that frequency because it may be more common. I mean, let's face it. The national simplex frequency, I hear people running up and down the 101 freeway all the time in Thousand Oaks, okay, on, um, you know, that, uh, and a lot of times I'll come back to people and just chat with them, right, on FM. Um, since I have the pan adapter on my rig, I, you know, I can pretty much see where everybody is. So that's a really, really helpful tool for them. That cover you? Yes, sir. Can you comment on power supplies? I can comment all you want. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, can you be a little more specific? Um, preferences, what you would say for the average radio? I'm, I'm, I'm in love with about a 30 watt or a 30 amp, 32 amp power supply. I really like those. Um, I think uh, Alinko makes a really good one, uh, and I have several of them. I have a few 15 amp power supplies that I use for some of the Chinese stuff, and it works fine. Get more than you need. Always get more than you need. That's my guy. How many computers do you want? No. <laughs> and that, you know, that's only a good tool of thumb is at least be overrated about 20%, right? When we sell anything in technology, we basically say, hey, you know, you need 20% expansion in it, right? I, you know, a good power supply, I run switching power supplies. I really don't have too much of a problem with them. Uh, if you want to run a linear power supply, you may have less noise. I really don't see the noise out of my power supply. I've got too much noise coming out of my new washer and dryer and the refrigerator and those friggin' uh, fluorescent, uh, you know, LED lights. Yeah. So, you know, the least of my worries right now are power supplies. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. So I received a QSL card over the summer. I don't have one. Where? And I'm not an artist, right? So where can you go to get them? Oh, just search, search Google. I think I used what was it, ReadyCheapQSLs.com or something like that. <laughs> you know, I'm serious. Yeah. I mean, just oh yes. Some of the uh, logging programs have a QSL uh, format that you can print your own. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Good point. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just another one, too. Um, you can get a postcard and just put a little sticker. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Absolutely. You don't have to buy QSL cards. Um, it's kind of it's kind of a cool thing. Okay, I, at least I think it's cool. My, my family probably thinks it's nerdy, geeky, <laughs> and old-fashioned. Yeah, but I have one of those Alinko 30-watt. Uh, 30 amp power supplies, and I'm wondering if it's starting to go south because so every once in a while I'll key up my 7100 and it'll, the radio will actually shut off and then come back on again. If I turn down the output power by about 10%, it works fine. Is that the power supply or I got something else going on? Boy, that's an amazing uh, question, uh, Bob. Uh, Here, let me Karnak the grave. <laughs> the last thing will All right, so remember that DVOM thing I was talking about? <laughs> What you want to do is you want to check what the output voltage is at the back of the radio. You want to check what the output pull uh, the output voltage is coming out of the power supply. What you may find is it may be the cable between the radio and the power supply. It may not be the power supply at all. Okay. Uh, typically, if the power supply is having problems, you're going to see a voltage drop on the needle on it. If you're not seeing that go down, then it probably isn't the power supply. But you don't know until you check it. Right? Famous last words. Um, the only other thing I'll toss out on that is uh, if you're running two 100 watt radios on the th same 30 amp power supply and they're both keen, that could be the problem. No. Okay. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Oh, one more from Andy. So with the pan adapter, I did a little bit of research. You mentioned dongles. So I have, I think, like the IQ outputs 
on on my radio. So you look. Have you found any good dongles? All right. So aren't you guys lucky? There's this YouTube channel uh -huh. that has all this stuff on it. It happens to be mine. <laughs> <laughs> so when you go, make sure you subscribe. Okay. okay. But, um, it's really easy to find. On YouTube, you can search my full name, Stuart Sheldon, all right, with no uh, spaces. Or you can type in videos.ag6ag.org, and it will redirect you to my YouTube channel. That's videos.ag6ag.org. I have several videos. As a matter of fact, this uh, talk's going to end up there probably in the next couple weeks. So uh, again, Check it out because I've got stuff on uh, using the S, uh, the, uh, the SDR dongle as a pan adapter, setting the software up, figuring all that stuff. And I have a video that I've done talking about how to get an antenna to it and share the antenna with the radio and some of the different methods to do that without blowing up your dongle every time you see your radio. <laughs> anyway, anything else? Yes, sir. Does the club have any HF nets, or are there any club members that participate in HF nets that maybe aren't sponsored by the club? Um, On the website, well, there's a whole listing of all the area HF nets, or all the nets, really. And uh, look the, at the informational list. that 15 uh, that 15 meter on Wednesday night. That's at seven. Yes. And that's at uh, 21.333. Mm -hmm. That right? Yeah. That's a pretty good guess. I haven't been on it in a while. But uh, they all get together there. Um, and uh, let's see, there's the maritime net. It's always neat to check into that. There's all sorts of stuff out there. And what page is that on again? Can you give that website again? Seabark.org. Seabark.org. OK, great website. Right there, can't miss it. www.seabark.org. Yes, sir? Just wanted to point out, for those who don't have a fan adapter, WebSDR.org is a great website with hundreds of SDR radios that you control, and you can use it like a pan adapter. Very cool, very cool. The only problem that I have with that is you need to find a radio that's close to you because it's kind of yeah, along the same lines you know, of you're propagation. Working 20 meters, you can pretty much see what the activity is. Yeah. You're tuned to it, and it's either there or not. Yeah, no, that's true. That's true. Uh, and of course, we didn't even talk about spotting networks or anything else. So, uh, but that's a subject for a different, uh, a different talk. Anything else? All right. Well, thank you very much. Well, that's the talk. I hope you enjoyed it. I sure enjoyed giving it. Anyway, if you're new to HF and you have any questions or if you want to comment, please use the comment windows below. Also, to get informed when we have new videos, please check on the subscribe button below. Anyway, thanks again and hope to hear you on the airways. 73 from AG6AG.